But you know what? It's okay to fail as long as you're striving for something beautiful. It's much better than just not striving, right? I mean, we can all give up tonight and just watch TV, or we could, you know, strive for something. Fall down a few times. Get back up. It's okay. There's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Thanks all for tuning in to Dreamcatchers, where we make things happen. Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dreams. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and I have the pleasure of having Josh McAllen with me today. Josh, how are things where you are? What part of the country are you in? We're up here in New Jersey right this minute, but we do a lot of work in Jersey, down to D.C., down to uh, Virginia. Oh, you got to come on down a little bit further to the Carolinas, man. I was just there recently. Myrtle. How far are you from Myrtle Beach? Oh, probably five or six hours. So it's still far, huh? Yeah, yeah. Everything's far. Anyway, before we dive in, how can the listeners get in contact with you? Because I know they're going to be stoked to talk to you after they hear this show. It's so good to be on a professional podcast with a professional podcast or and a dream realizer like you. So thank you for introducing us. The biggest thing, the easiest way would just be to look up on any podcast platform, Capital Hacking, two words, Capital Hacking, and you're going to get to your home base. That's where we are. Anywhere. You can do the internet. You can do social media. You can do podcasting. And any of those platforms, just type in Capital Hacking and you'll find us. Beautiful. So Josh, you're a capital hacker. You believe in the community. You've done a ton before you got to this place. Do me a big favor and tell me a little bit about how you started out on this journey of catching your dreams of creating a capital hacking community. Yes. I just, by the way, just the more I can say thank you to you and your community, the dream catchers, I love it. I love your ethos and what you're teaching people. It's really important that everybody realizes they have human capital. We have it right now. If you're listening to this, that means you have ears to hear. Please listen to Morpheus over here, my friend Jerome. Our journey started through, hey, look, like most of us that are real people, uh, we grew up in a humble situation. So all the way from the childhood, we were scrappy workers. You know, I started working at 12. I didn't have a father at home. My poor mom had a stroke at 27 years old. Never worked again, the poor lady. So uh, my brother and I, you know, we just found ways to sell things. We sold cotton candy. We sold all kinds of unique little things and then just started working. Eventually, a couple opportunities opened up and a dream of mine did happen. I got into land development. And it's a long story from from growing up a humble kid that always had the dream to be in land development, going through the... I was a teacher. I taught civics and economics and even religion, theology stuff. So I taught all that kind of stuff at first. And then from that, just started a course to get into business. And there was this time where I got to meet these developers and pitch them sales strategies. How could you sell a neighborhood faster You know, if you build a neighborhood? And a bunch of them started to take a liking to me as I was a scrappy like... You could call me like a business uh, presenter. I would make little pitches, you know, in the, in the late 2006 or so. And they, they put me on the, the team and they ended up giving me the responsibility. It was the time when everybody who had a pickup truck was a general contractor. And so they let me be the boss of con- general contractors, right? Like just be a project manager, help us build some fancy, fancy flips. I mean, like $5 million house flips, crazy fancy. So I jumped right into real estate at the highest level, really. But I was not the guy who knew how to screw the, the screw the, the 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 building together. But I knew how to I knew how to make sure the plans got built. I knew how to make sure people were treated with respect, and that they showed up and they got paid, and all those components that really start the ball rolling. And then from that, you know what? There was a, a big change where we went from flipping, trying to flip houses, to trying to salvage old resorts, right? Almost like resort flippers. On bigger pockets, they they call me um, the resort burr guy, you know, because what we were doing way before I knew the burr strategy was we were buying them. We were, we were either owning them already and trying to rehab them, or buying them to rehab them. And it's it's a lot like flipping a house, only on a mega scale. And from that, we became really good operators, put incredible teams around us, kind of like you. 
And now we are really dedicated to our capital community, which we, we actually treat our investors uh, very much like a community. So totally different. And that community is called Accountable Equity. It's a whole different vibe, right? You invest with people like you and I because you need a passive income. But wouldn't it be great if we could build events four times a year, education platforms, keynote speakers, you could visit your resorts. So that has metamorphosized into a, a transformative part of my life for the last three years, I think now. And we are super grateful to lead accountable equity. That's what that is. But today, I got to tell you, our passion and the reason we're here on your show and the reason we get to talk to Morpheus is there's so much power in each of us. But we have to take the red pill, like you said. And Capital Hacking is like dedicated to helping people take the red pill. Wow. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> you've taken what's been kind of cold, the syndication model, and you've created a family around it and adding in lifestyle and travel and education and really just giving folks an opportunity to actually be around like-minded people and make money with like-minded people. Where did you figure out this amazing marketing strategy? Was it something that just came along or like, tell me more about that. Yeah. So I can tell by your questions that, you know, you know, this world so well from your work in multifamily, I believe. Right. So it, it came to us when we were running three mega, mega resorts. These things we bought as dilapidated, literally one of them was dilapidated. The others just were ugly. And we became very good at that because I wasn't using my money because I didn't have any money. So this is back 10 years ago. It was the money of the wealthiest people in the area, right? So the really large wealthy families were supporting the business. It was their capital, not our capital. What we realized later was we earned sweat equity as human capital and how powerful that is, right? Like put the, put the programs together, make sure you hire the right people, make sure the culture's right, turn a great profit and you earn into the business. So that's kind of how my journey went. While doing that, you and I, have a lot of the same friends. You probably know. Um, have you ever heard of Dave Zook? Yeah. Okay. So Dave Zook was a guest at our resorts uh, for years, for the last seven, eight years at our resorts. And I got to know him because I loved his family and his brother and we would buy things from his family because they, they, they build buildings, right? So um, I got to know him. I got to know his dad, his family. And one time he sat me down and he goes, I got to teach you about the real estate guys radio. And I got to teach you about how syndication works. And to the point where he even brought me with them to Belize and we, we spent a week with our uh, CPA strategists like from Tom Wilwright's group. And it, the world changed for me, Jerome. I took the red pill. I was like, oh my gosh, it doesn't have to be the wealthiest people in the world that own resorts. I thought you and I might think, oh, only the fattest cats, the richest dudes and ladies that were inherited money and all that. I thought those were the only people that had the ability to buy these big buildings or Wall Street. Wall Street can do whatever they want because you know it's just paper anyway. But but what about you and I, just normal people that know how to work hard? Could we buy in to something like this? And so Dave taught me how that works. Uh, the real estate guys took care of my wife and I, Melanie. And what happened is as we were hearing the beauty of syndication and how it allows normal good families to own the tax benefits, the income, the passive investing for freedom strategies, it like a whole bunch of gears, chick, 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 went through our brain, right, Jerome? And they, they started meshing together. I'm like, oh my gosh, we could do the same thing we were doing for the wealthiest people in the world for good families all over the country. Normal families, hardworking families. They could put their IRA money in with us. They don't, they don't have to be fat cats. And I don't mean anything bad about fat cats. It's just, I'm not a fat cat. I never, I never grew up with money. So I never thought we could get involved in these things. Well, anyway, that whole transformative thing combined with the fact that we were uh, considered one of the you know, most up and coming hospitality professional companies in the country at the time, ranked in Wall Street Journal, all kinds of stuff. So what we did is we merged our passion for treating people with dignity and respect in hospitality. We merged that with our concept of letting investors own these deals with us. And we came up with something very different. It's, it's a very dynamic community where people, they spend time with us. It's not just you invest with us. You actually join, I call it a free mastermind room. It's like a free mastermind because I, the keen, by the way, the investors are people like you know them. I mean, it's Matt Faircloth, it's uh, people from Bigger Pockets, it's um, Cashflow Ninja, you know, Dr uh, MC Laubscher are big investors with us. So it's like the best speakers in the industry are our investors. So why not put on 
conferences, internal mastermind conferences. So I know you and I know what I'm talking about. I'm sure your listeners are like, what the hell is that guy talking about? Well, you get it, though, because why not let the human capital benefit all of us? You know, if, if I'm going to be in a community with you, Jerome, how great would it be for me to invite you to meet some of my friends? You know, once I get to meet the Morpheus, Jerome Myers, Mayor, I, I want to introduce you to my friends. Right. So why not? Why not just keep doing that on a cycle? So we do it every quarter. We call them learn and grow events. Well, sorry for that deep dive, but you asked the good question. So I had to give you a good answer. No, don't apologize because this is different than anything I'm seeing anywhere else. Everybody else gets sent to videos or they get the email sequence, but you guys are making a true investment in the community. And I think that's why you have traction and why you're growing and why you're allowing people to get access to things that they wouldn't normally be able to get access to. So I think it's a excellent opportunity to expose people to the model because it is different. It is unique. It is transformative. And so you mentioned Dave Zook showed up and kind of took you by the hand and opened up some doors for you. But were there other people that showed up along the way that helped you get to the place where you are now? Yeah. And I think this is probably one of the core thoughts of your teaching, right, uh, Jerome, is that if you surround yourself with good people, that you'll just keep pushing you. It keeps happening. So Jerome, uh, uh, Dave introduced me to the real estate guys. I, I fell in love with their type of I call it honest, ethical, straightforward syndication. You know, it's not that flashy. It's kind of like, hey, here's who we are. 99% of why you invest in this deal should be the people who run the deal, right? I mean, you probably teach that to your team too. It's okay to have a great deal. This building will make money. But if you don't have a great team to put together to run it, don't worry about buying it because it may not work out. It's the team. It's always the human capital. And that's why people like you and I want to be around people that can influence us to get a little better every day, a little better every day. So it was a hundred different people since Dave Zook. It was the Dave Zooks. Then I stumbled onto bigger pockets. Then I stumbled into GoBundance and joined GoBundance, which is a really important mastermind nationally. And then from that, I got to know Josh Dork in a little bit. And I never got to really meet Brandon Turner. I met him and Dave, Dave Green I've had dinner with, but I don't know those guys as well. But Josh, you know, I've spent many times talking to him. And that opened up another idea. And so then Matt Faircloth joined me and then podcasting became part of our life. And it was during that journey, podcasting was the common thread, right? Dave Zook introduced me to some things like Real Estate Guys Radio, which I stumbled into Bigger Pockets. I stumbled into MC Laubscher. And so what, what happened? Well, I just started reaching out to all of them and invited them to find out why we're, we're a lot like multifamily syndicators in a way. You're buying a building. It has cash flow. You earn a yield. But it's a resort. Now, we make a lot more yield than a typical multifamily because we buy them cheap. You know, you know how hard it is to buy a cheap multifamily right now, right, Trump? So we're buying things cheap and we're adding sales. Sales are the magic elixir for business. And when we, add, we buy cheap, add sales and construction, we fix them up. And then we treat people with kindness and love. We have a special type of hospitality. We train on it every week. It's a whole nother podcast. I'll teach you about that sometime because that, that's the secret sauce really is treat people with love and respect. Everybody who walks through the door has the same infinite dignity and worth. And boy, are we honored and humbled to be able to be their servant while they're on property. you know. And we teach that. None of us are perfect. But, we, we, but you know what? It's okay to fail as long as you're striving for something beautiful. It's much better than just not striving, right? I mean, we can all give up tonight and just watch TV, or we could, you know, strive for something, fall down a few times, get back up. It's okay. By the way, you and I love uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, I bet. Yeah. Well, I, I like his. Robert's a little sensational for me. And uh, okay. Well, he, he did the intro to our big capital hacking show because uh, – he likes the idea of get back up and the fact that, you know, I mean, I don't want to speak against anything you've taught about him, but I mean, he, he, he basically taught us the red pill. A lot of it came from him. I didn't know that you could own businesses and things like that until I read that book. I like his, I like the book a lot, right? I like the purple book a lot. I like the concepts around the cash flow quadrant, but just sometimes he goes on his rants and I think he gets a little derogatory and he, I don't think he has to be in order to, communicate the message. That's all. That's a great point. Well said. So, you know, we've, we've talked about the people who've helped you and kind of the relationships. The one thing that 
I haven't ever asked before, but I'm curious with you is how did you change on this journey in order to attract those people? I mean, Go Abundance is one of the highest level masterminds, one of the most expensive ones in the country. How did you change in order to be a person that fit in that room and would attract folks, really wealthy individuals who want to spend time with you? It's a great question. I would say from a young age, you know how sometimes we, it, it, some things come from your personality, right? So you have, my wife is a master teaching that there's different personalities. There's sanguines who like being around people. There's, in, there's a melancholics who like to think first and meet one. There's cholerics and there's all these different personality types. I don't know. Some things come a little natural to you and I. Different things come natural to different people. And so what, one thing that came natural to me early on was a, I kind of felt like I didn't have much, you know, whether it be no father, whether it be not much any cash. We lived on welfare for most of my life growing up. So I never really had a fear of loss, right? So if you, if you can get rid of a fear of loss, no matter where you are in the world, and you care about people first, like I, we, we we're big advocates of Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People which is the original self-help book written over a hundred years ago. Remember all he said was be sincerely interested in their needs, not your needs, their needs, whoever they are, the other, the other person. So I always, you know, I'm hardwired to care about other people and I'm hardwired not to be afraid. So all we have to do is add value then. Right. And I don't know, like I said, different people have different gifts. I, other people have many gifts I don't have, but those are some strengths that we can bring to the table. And I think other people, I have to work on them too. Um, but uh, there's just this strength about not being afraid to be embarrassed or not be afraid to uh, say something that wasn't right. And, and someone says, Hey, I don't agree with you. It's okay, fine. Let's, let's hear you out, you know? And so as long as you're not overly anxious, that here's the thing, there's a, there's a principle, like, do you feel, this is for you, whoever's driving around. Do you feel that if you make a mistake, you're not worthy? Or do you feel like you have a chance to learn something? And so anyway, I'm happy to put myself in very difficult situations all the time. Very happy. You know, I'm happy to be on a big famous podcast with you right now and have you hit me with questions I don't know the answer to. I'm fine with that. Let's let's figure it out together. So I think maybe that's something we can all build in our lives is, is, is to control our anxieties and fears. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And once it's you so overcome that, Get in the room. I, I get in the room. If I boiled it all down to a sentence, I think it's the willingness to be authentic and vulnerable and not fear the judgment that could come from showing up as you where you are. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And I, I believe in it one thousand percent. I'm always willing to ask a stupid question, right? Because there's somebody else in the room that's wondering the same thing. They just aren't willing to put themselves out there and ask it. And if you're willing to ask it, it can go one or two ways, right? They can say, oh, man, that was really dumb. Why don't you know that? <laughs> or it can go, man, <laughs> I never thought about that. This is amazing. Uh, let's talk some more about it. And, I mean, relationships can go anywhere from there. So the next thing, I, everything, you, you talked about these really challenging properties that you're buying. Right. You talked about the community that you were building. And I just assume that all of that stuff is one perfectly every single step of the way. Right. <laughs> no, not never. And that's why we say when you, whenever you're going to invest with someone, please get to know them because how are they going to handle being punched in the belly? Right. Or in the face, like uh, what was it? My, Mr. Mike Tyson said, you know, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. So the great news is that's so true for what we all do, right? We all buy these buildings and we try to do a business plan to turn them around and to provide profits back. Well, COVID's a good punch, right? So how do, how do you respond to punches? No, no, there's probably not been a month in the last two years where we haven't had a pretty sizable challenge, whether it be the construction. We, we buy very complex projects. So the construction, all you have to do is say the word construction and you know it's challenging, right? But we do restoration, which is even a little harder because you want to take care of the building. And it, anyway, long story, I would say we have a struggle probably every couple of days. And as long as you're okay with my, fighting through it and having a team around you that is going to come up with creative ideas and then, and then work to make them happen. Um, 
that's how we get over things. But yeah, we have plenty of problems. Like, for example, we were in a book. We got to write a, a chapter in a book that was called Don't Quit, right? And so if you're, if you're able to write a chapter in a book called Don't Quit, there might have been a reason you should have quit whatever that was a long time ago. Because that, you know, but my joke is, is I lost a business 10 years ago. Before I got into the resort flipping, I was, um, you know, there was, a, there was a gap, right, between the house boom and then the economy staling, stalling out for a long time, remember, from 08, whatever, till 11, where we were not yet resort developers. We, were, we had finished being recognized as pretty good house flippers at the highest level, and then there was nothing to do. So during that time, I took the little bit of savings Melanie and I had, and we bought a franchise business, and we lost the whole thing, every dollar. Totally humiliating business failure and i remember um it broke it broke a lot of hearts in my family my wife heart her heart was broken many times i mean and uh the end the end was the me handing the keys back to this franchise business which was like truck based we cleaned really dangerous things like kitchens that are grease filled and grease traps and really hard business i bought it because i thought well in a, in a down economy at least you have to do the basics like I thought it was one of those businesses that was kind of recession resistant. And it was, if you knew how to sell. And at the time, I thought, oh, I'll hire a sales team and we'll, we'll sell. Well, guess what? Probably lack of my leadership, um, lack of focus on sales. Fast forward, we had six months of hemorrhaging money and then six months of making money. But the six months of making money was when we had an epiphany. We're selling. We're a sales company. We know how to, we're going to create value propositions. We're going to talk to as many good restaurateurs as possible. Then we actually learned how to sell. So it's kind of a silver lining. We were awful, and then we were pretty good. But guess what? The pretty good wasn't able to overcome the back dude, the bills. So no matter how good we got, I barely could keep the dog afloat. So at the end of the day, the franchise business said, can we have the keys to this big machinery and truck back, and uh, we'll let you out of the deal. So I handed them the keys and $200,000 of book of business that we'd started from zero, and we got back zero meaning we gave them our entire life savings, never got a paycheck. You know, when you start in the business, you're the one who doesn't get the paycheck. Everybody else gets paid. You got to pay everybody, right? So that was a big, big problem in our house. <laughs> and Melanie turns to me one night when we literally had gotten rid of the keys and gotten out of the contract and we were just out of cash. No job, nothing. It was still the down economy, right? It wasn't a great economy in 2010. So I didn't know where I was going to go next, right? But... Uh, she says, how could you lose everything failed us? You know? And uh, I said, you know what, hon? I think this is the middle of the movie. I was like, this is the middle of the movie. And, you know, I'm a big movie fan. I could probably, you know, quote a line from any movie you throw at me. So I love movies. So I'm like, oh, dude, it was like a refreshing mindset for me. I'm like, oh, it's OK to be totally a loser right now because this makes the rest of the story a little better. So we just kind of plugged away for a few more years until we started hitting the home runs. Wow. Talk about vulnerable. And they, they, so, so they captured that in this little book. And it's like, I always, I literally, I literally joke. It's called don't quit. And you know, it's with a bunch of people you may know it's a compilation book. And uh, you know, you probably should have quit. I think we should have quit that business. It wasn't exactly the right fit, but boy, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Now we know how to organize uh, a sales office. I'll tell you that much right now. You'll never lose that skill again, right? What's up, tribe? It's your host, Jerome. I just want to let you know that we put together a free 15-point checklist for exiting the matrix. Jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up. Let's get back to the show. So... That is the red pill moment, right? And so what in that moment said, we got to keep going? Like, you could have just went and got a job, right? Yeah. But you decided, I got to keep going. What, what in that made you say, I got to keep going? Yeah, that's a great question. Melanie would, would ask me, yeah, that, that would be something she would want to know too. Hmm, why did I know we would get there someday? I don't know. I, 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 I uh, that might be a blessing from God, you know, just, just a conviction that we're supposed to be building things. And I don't mean buildings, but I mean, right now we have like 150 employees, Jerome. And our favorite thing is to make sure they know they're loved. And, you know, we love, 
What do we mean by love? We don't mean Kim Kardashian, though I think she's a pleasant person. She loves pe- she loves jewelry, right? That's a different type of love. I'm talking about your mom. Your mom loves you differently. She'll clean up your vomit if you're having a flu or whatever. That kind of love, sacrificial love, kindness. So, you know, look, we're not perfect. We make tons of mistakes. Uh, I have to apologize to our team every once in a while. I definitely lose temper. We're not. Uh, here's the deal. We're not here to lose now. We lost already. We lost it 10 years ago. We're never losing again. We're, 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 we may get punched, as, as our friend Mike Tyson says, but we're not going to stop. We're going to get back up. We're like the dog that you have to end up you know, giving in to this dog because I'm chasing you. So my point is um, that fire in the belly was always there that I knew we were supposed to build that I, I don't know. We never questioned it. Wow. Never questioned it. Even there. So what was your worst fear in the process and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think the the biggest fear of, of what, being an entrepreneur or leading people. Look, going on this journey, the journey. right? Because you've... Yeah, we've had, we've had a rocky road. Uh, the biggest fear is... Seeing that interesting? I'm not plagued by too many fears, Jerome. I'm really not. I don't know. I mean, look, what do I not like? I don't like our poor kids. I don't like them being overly influenced by social media. That's one fear I have. Uh, uh, I don't like negative talk in my house. That's a fear. I don't know how to ask my family to stop that. I have 10 children, Jerome. I have 10 children and a lovely wife for 24 years. So uh, we're all... By the way, I would have adopted as many as I could, but we didn't adopt any yet where we're, that's all natural. And, um, so you have different personalities, Jerome, you know, I have some daughters and some sons that are not so happy all the time. You know, that the world is out to get them kind of thing. And, and I really want to help them take the red pill, you know? And, uh, and, and that's why we did the show capital hack because I'm that poor kid, just like you, you know, your audience might have a few that, we can do it, guys and ladies. We can do it. So Capital Hacking started with a dream that we could share that red pill story of you have power. As a matter of fact, if you ever listen to the show uh, intro, you'll, you'll be dying laughing because it's all these, you know, you have the power, guys. You have the power to, uh, to start on any path you want. Take the effort. There is no magic. There's no uh, lottery. Here, you want to hear about the lottery real quick? I do. Okay. Well, Jerome, you and I, I don't know if you play the lottery. I do not play the lottery. No, I can't. Wait. I never even have once said, oh, I better go buy a lottery ticket. It's a hundred million dollars. But ironically, Jerome, my father, who left our family for early on in childhood, but he married this nicer woman, this nice woman. And in 1985, she won the damn lottery, the real lottery. Is that the craziest thing? So I actually know somebody that I used to go to her house all the time who actually won the millions of dollar lottery. Okay. But, you know, weirdly, she didn't get too much money. She got like, she had to split it with five other people that won. It was a different time. It was the 80s. So it was like a $5 million jackpot split five ways. She ended up getting 40K a year. It wasn't, the, it wasn't like the biggest deal. It changed their life, but not, they, didn't, they didn't buy Mercedes or anything. Right? So, so I've actually seen people in the lottery. But this morning, I was at the, 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 the convenience shop buying a delicious cup of coffee up here in New Jersey and Philly and, and the whole Northeast. We all call it Wawa, the Wawa. We were at the Wawa this morning. And in front of me was this lovely lady. And she's buying a lottery ticket. And the gentleman behind is like, I hope you win. and It'll be great. You know, I want to win too. She goes, you know, sometimes it may not be good if you get it all uh, too much too fast. All right. And that is, she, she was probably right. It was a lot of wisdom in that. She's, I don't know. She's kind of like bittersweet buying the lottery ticket. I don't know. She's like, I, if I win, I still would be a little afraid to get it all at once. She's probably right. You know, it's a little better to get punched every once in a while on your path to success. And success isn't the end goal, right? We want to keep adding value for people. And that's what capital hacking is. Capital hacking is not, there's no cost. There's nothing. I don't sell anything. There's no uh, masterminds to join. There's nothing but incredible world-class guests every time. And we just go, like you, we just ask tough questions and see how their heart works. Well, and that's the thing that's been jumping out time and time again as you've answered these questions is you're just a great human being, Right. But well, not any different than you, Jerome. I'm just trying. We're just trying. We're not great yet, right? We got to work at it. Well, but the intentionality of wanting to serve, the intentionality of believing that everybody has value and dignity and that 
potentially they can teach you something, even if it's what not to do. It's something that is just continuing to bubble up and bubble over for me as I listen to you share. And the thing that I, I think I found the most interesting so far is just when you've been there and you kind of know what the bottom of the pool yes. feels like, you know, like this is kind of as bad as it gets. And now all I have to do is swim to get that gulp of air. And then if I am uh, back down here, I know what it feels like. And I know what it takes to get back out. Like that is what it really takes in order to be a true success. Right. Because there's going to be some ups and downs. It doesn't matter what you do as an entrepreneur, it's not always going to work out the way you expect it to. And having the folks around you, the thing that I think blew my mind though, is you said you have 10 (laughs) kids and you've been on this journey. Like that is the excuse that most people use for why they can't do the thing that's on their heart. Oh my gosh, you're right. I guess uh, most people don't say, by the way, Jerome, you you really reflect beautifully when you you comment on things. Huh? Jerome, I don't know if you ever share videos, but I'm showing Jerome guys while we're doing this podcast, the kids, because Jerome's next question is, I need to see a picture. He didn't actually say it, but he, he needed to see that there really are 10 kids. It's like shocking to me, brother. Be- it's shocking to me. <laughs> <laughs> 24 years and 10 kids. Like, but seriously, that is the thing that people say is, I don't want to make my family uncomfortable, so I've got to stay and do this job that doesn't actually make me feel better or fulfilled inside, but I do it because I want to provide a comfortable life for them. And you're like, the reason why I got to do this thing is because of them. Yeah, it's a beautiful right? point. And it's totally, it, I mean, and you like to flip things on his head as we've established at least two or three times along this journey. And this paradigm shift for me is just phenomenal. You're a living example of the reason why people can't use that excuse. It's all the more reason why you should, not the reason why you shouldn't. And I think one of the things you haven't said in this phrase, but is the true way that you live your life is it didn't happen to me. It happened for me. Mm. Right. So in that space where you just gave up your life savings and handed somebody the key, say, hey, take it away. And I think you're probably smiling a little bit as it goes away. Like, I don't have to deal with that anymore. <laughs> <I was. laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like, you're throwing in the towel. Like, what, now what are you going to do, fearless leader? And I can't imagine. Like, I think everybody's worst fear. And you didn't. I thought you might say this, but everybody's worst fear is the person who's their cheerleader saying, how could you do that? Like, oh, what's yeah. the what's your bright idea now? And like, that didn't even phase you. You just, you moved on to the next thing. You know what? That's a great point, Jerome. Since you have one of the most probing shows I've ever been on, uh, I will say it's not always easy because my wife is the stable Eddie. We know how to build things and grow things, which means we're inherently not going to stay status quo. That's, that's not that that's the biggest blessing. We're the kind of people that can build multiple businesses and things like that. But the, the challenge is to be married to me. So you are right, Jerome. That 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 did hurt her a lot. Um, and um, you're right. You said it right. I definitely never want her to turn her back on me. So that is a fear. And um, a few times I pushed her to the brink. Um, that time was the biggest was because we did have like six kids. I mean, we had a lot of kids at the time, but you are right about the bottom of the pool. No one's ever said that. Isn't that a powerful thing that you could teach people on your show? Just go ahead and take a look at the bottom of the pool. Even if you haven't gotten there yet or wherever it is, fall off the chair. How bad is it? You know, how bad is that? Can you, can you get it? Can you get over that? You okay. Can you control that fear? Then you're unstoppable a little bit unstoppable. If you can harness that anxiety, uh, get you, look, we all have anxiety. Uh, right now, our biggest anxiety, Mr. Jerome, is we have investors and we cherish them. So we work our ass off probably harder than before even when we always worked pretty hard. We can't wait to replenish all their capital accounts, give them all back the profits they wanted. And for us, it's perpetual equity. So they're part of our deals forever because we're building a portfolio of resorts. And they're growing in value quite substantially because, again, the way you and I know commercial real estate works, it's different. You fix them up. That's not how you change the value. It's selling. Once you sell and make money, the value goes up. So we're able to kind of do very, very large multiples on people's money over five years. 
And the bottom line is I, that's what empowers me right now. I know it's their life savings. It's their kids college fund. It's a, it's a, I cherish that man. That's why we, that's why we kind of created that mastermind community for them is whatever I can give them back now while their money's growing. uh, I want to give them back now life value. Beautiful. So, all right, Josh, what's your biggest approach to life today versus pre giving the keys back on the truck? Oh, teams. Okay. That was another big, that was probably the biggest change is back then I was the hardest hustler in the team all the time, everywhere. And, uh, there's that old saying, I think it's an, it might be an African saying it's, or it's not from this country. It's an old saying that says, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so teams are not a joke for us. Like my point is we're not, um, we're never trying to be the all things to everyone ever again. Never, 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 ever. So we have amazing operators, amazing chefs in our operating business in the capital groups. We have amazing partners and we don't mind that they own part of the deal. And we're happy. We're happy that more people own the deal than just us. Melanie and I, Melanie says she's a lovely fundraiser. You should see this lady give a talk because she's speaking from the heart. Mama 10. Right. And she says, Honestly, if there's a day when we don't need investors because we have capital, which we didn't have at first, cash capital, but we're building capital, we would still syndicate every deal because of the power of all those people pulling for you. They're in it to win it with you. And uh, the beauty of being able to contribute to their families' lives, we're not going to look we're very, we're very interested in this. It's a whole, that's, the, that's another red pill. The fact that what we do was always was out there I, none of us even knew about it like some so few of us knew that you could buy mega real estate deals as long as you put a team together i mean i really always thought it was only the richest people could do it right i thought you had to be born that way but now i know you don't have to be born that way the ability to create your own finish i love it so what are you most grateful for right this minute you I am really grateful for the way you're doing this interview. Totally different than what I thought you were going to do. Uh, You're a heck of a probing uh, interviewer. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm very grateful. My wife and I are in love and we're not exactly, you know, butterfly in love right this minute, but we're fighting through, you know, some struggles. My poor mom, my poor wife lost her beloved father out of the freaking blue. Not like one of those six years of passing away. wasn't, it was he went in for a preventative surgery and had a complication. It's one of the saddest things uh, that ever happened to her life because he was nobody thought he would. It was one of those things where he, he had the boat ready for the next day. He was going to take his little boat out. He has a little tiny boat. So my point is, uh, I think we're most grateful right now for. Um, thank you for letting me share these stories, but also my wife. Awesome. And after two and a half decades, I mean, a lot of people don't use those words anymore right there don't really appreciate the person that's been there that long and so that's a testament to you guys and the really hard work people think hey getting to the finish the finish line is getting married that's just the beginning guys oh yeah that's just that's great (laughs) advice sir that's just the beginning you start the marathon then but so get ready to run and work (laughs) real quick before you let me go though sir what is your What was your epiphany that happened to you? The red pill. How did you get so reflective and heartfelt? There were a few. Um, I think the one that was probably the, that took me to this place was in 2012 when my buddy Hambone died. We used to lead the football team out. We were co-captains of the team. We used to lead the team out. And I was thinking about this morning when I was running and you know, the two biggest guys on the team were behind us and we're smaller than them. I was playing safety. He was a linebacker and he died just kind of out of the blue, like you just described with your wife's father and he was 30. And I left at, I don't know, five or six o'clock to drive to the funeral. And I got there three hours early. And on my drive, I started asking a question, am I going for him or am I going for me? Because we hadn't talked since the day we graduated high school. 
right? So, so the whole 12 years have passed. And what I realized is like that guy pound for pound was one of the best human beings I'd ever met in life. Like he was always consistent, always pretty even killed, never really lost his temperature, his temper and just super kind and generous. And so if somebody like that could pass away and I was still here, I better make sure that I live out every day in a manner that I'm worthy to still be breathing because he wasn't, right? And so I made some really dramatic changes in my life over the next 12 months because I'd been chasing money, right? I had the 6,000 square foot house. I was in the cars on so many different levels. And so I was spending a lot of money on fancy cars that went fast. And it's just like, but I was empty on the inside. So on the outside, everything looked amazing, but I was miserable. Um, And so fast forward, I started asking all these really tough questions and adjusting the way that I, I show up in life and go back to that place of authenticity and vulnerability that you brought up. And it was like, okay, so this is who I am and I'm unapologetic about it. I'm not interested in trying to fit in. And it changed my career. It changed my, it, it was crazy because the things that I was most scared of showing people were the things that catapulted me to even more income right? and bigger responsibility and more people interested in connecting with me and supporting whatever mission that I was leading at the time. And so that was the moment though, on that drive, I, I was, it was three hours there. I got to the church. I was the only person there. And so I left because it was in my hometown and went and sat in front of the house that I grew up in. And I realized that that house could fit in my basement almost two times. Right. And I was like, all right. Somewhere along the way, I, I, I messed up. I lost it. I forgot what was truly important. And what's truly important is the people. And this is why I'm so excited about you and your story, because there's so few people, you're in a really tough industry, right? The hospitality industry is super tough, right? And it's service work and a lot of people are ungrateful. And it's just like, but no, we want to serve you. We, we get joy from serving you. And then when you add in, oh, well, we got these people who are trusting us with their life savings. And they don't really understand, most people don't really understand how tough that business is. So for you to outperform and return to them is, I'll call it a miracle because I have a pretty good understanding of what it takes, right? But if you don't return what you say you're going to return, they are pretty upset, right? And so you're rolling up a hill, a really big boulder, and the kind of counterintuitive guidance that you're giving to your team is just phenomenal for me because I do believe, and I've done it in a couple of different places, that you can have a heart for the people. You can expect to do the right thing for the person and that might not be the absolute right business decision short range and get tremendous results from a profitability standpoint. But there's so few leaders who actually have the courage because it's really hard to explain that to somebody who only is looking at the bottom line and looking at a spreadsheet and doesn't realize there's a human being on the other side of that name and and that paycheck or the amount that goes on that check. And so, yeah, man, I appreciate you asking that question. And that's kind of the story. And I rambled on a little bit, but yeah. Beautiful story. Wow. What was your friend's name? His name was Leonard Robinson, but we called him Hambone. Hambone, Hambone. What a powerful uh, impact he's made on you, me, you first, now me, now everyone listening. Thank you, Hambone. Sure. So, still got a few questions for you, and I think this one will be most interesting. What are you most focused on catching next? You're building capital hacking. What is that? Maybe what does that look like in the future, or is there something else that's on the horizon that's coming? Yep. Capital hacking. We want this to. Um, we want to attract some young talent right now to help us grow the the the, the 
the community. We, we're so grateful to have a very large listener base, but we have to activate and do more things for them. So that's a very important target for us right now uh, on the world of podcasting. And then in the world of um, our, our day-to-day business, our daily business, is we're probably going to purchase two or three properties this year uh, that are mega on sale. And our business is a little less question, like whatever you call it, like uh, confusing than you might think because we are, uh, we sell weddings at our resorts and we, we only buy properties. They may be on sale and they may need physical work, but they already, we don't buy them unless they're already getting hundreds and hundreds of women calling to have their wedding there. So we can do a math analysis that says that many phone calls equals that many sales, that many revenue. And then I can basically plot out the cash deposits and when we'll get them. And, and we've been doing this now five times and uh, five resorts in the last few years. And it, it's pretty, it's not easy, but it's, it's mathematical almost if you do it the right way. And if you treat people the right way, see, see nothing works in this business. And I, I would argue any business if you don't treat people without right question, way. Josh, what gift are you giving the world? Oh, gratitude, man. I'm just grateful. I hope people can pick up on that and be grateful for their family. And the final question. What's the one thing you want people to take away from this call? Honestly, this is practical, my friend. I want them to go hit Capital Hacking and subscribe and let's get you on that big show. Let's get the community growing. It's all about helping people rise. They have power. See, capital can be defined as power. So you have it. First, you have it. Then you can attract it into your life in the cash form. Cash comes second, but you have it, guys. You have it. Let's, let's get some strategies in your heart. Let's get you the right community around you. Let's get you some new friends that can add value to your life. Join us. Beautiful. Josh, thank you so much for joining us on the Dream Catchers podcast. And to the listeners, if you don't hear anything else, know that your dreams should be real. We'll talk soon. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.